All right, hi, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Tiano. I'm going to do a board review with you guys today. Uh, I don't have a thank you page, but big thanks to all my fellows for helping me review this. And big, <laughs> so Kosher Shah, Dr. Weber, Dr. Howe, Dr. Shore, Dr. Malnu, Dr. Bulbrun. Thank you for all your help. I said Dr. Malnu, yeah. Thank you for your help. And thank you, um, all the residents who completed uh, our questions before. So let's just get started. Um, I think overall, uh, the residents did very well on these sets of questions, so uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, so this is the first question that was sent uh, to the class before this. So this is a six-year-old boy presenting with several weeks of worsening hip pain. Um, this is a musculoskeletal board review. Uh, he's a normal examination of the left knee, but the left hip shows limited range of motion, particularly with abduction and internal rotation. His x-ray showing is above what's most likely diagnosis. And uh, the answer is... Uh, one, uh, like birth cath, like cath birth. Uh, as you can see, the left uh, femoral head is um, is, uh, um, is, uh, is very malformed. And uh, and um, yeah, the vast majority of you got this question right, so congratulations. Um, so just to go over like cath birth, it's an aeropathic process of the femoral head. Uh, mostly in the pediatric age, young kids are around three to 12, um, usually affects boys more than girls. And it's typically an indolent presentation, so like a chronic... Uh, slowly developing hip pain and could be also be bilateral. Uh, usually, uh, worse with activity and relieved with rest. And there's limited hip reduction, internal rotation on physical exam. Um, yeah, this pretty classic board question and thing they're going to be tested on. Um, the way you diagnose this with an X-ray, obviously with AP and front leg uh, X-rays, uh, you'll typically find this is a pretty classical physical exam finding. Um, you'll see uh, femoral head appears smaller on the unaffected side. You'll see a widened joint space. You'll see a crescent sign, which is subchondral collapse. And then later stage, you'll see a, a fragmented femoral head as in the arrow right there. Um, if, you, if you find a child that you're concerned with, like any child with limping or hip pain or someone who's obese, uh, you should make them non-weight bearing, give them crutches as much as possible and refer them to orthopedics. Um, yeah, the treatment is, uh, there's no large trials in treatment. Sometimes they're surgical, sometimes they're not. Um, almost all children do pretty well, uh, but they, <laughs> Younger you're diagnosed, the better prognosis you have. And it's because the younger you are, the more bone remodeling you go through. And so, um, you know, uh, as soon as uh, the appropriate treatment and physical therapy is instituted, then uh, kids end up doing uh, better than that. These are some complications that you might, you should be aware of. So uh, with like half birth, obviously you should have some morphologic changes in the femoral head. Uh, you can get osteochondritis disican. So that's uh, when the bone underneath the cartilage joint dies due to lack of blood flow, and that's due to um, the constant uh, irritation between the femoral head and the acetabulum, you might have some impingement in the area too. In the long term, you're going to have early onset osteoarthritis in the 30s and 40s, and so that's why you want to uh, identify these children early and get them the appropriate treatment. All right, so we'll go on to question two, kind of similar. Um, so another obese, 12, uh, obese kid, 12-year-old, he's uh, he has uh, hip pain on the right on the right side, as well as knee, knee pain limping. He has a normal knee exam as well, but also limited range of motion on the right side. Uh, this is his x-ray and what's the most likely diagnosis. You can take a second to look. All right, so this is Skiffy. Uh, as you can see on the right side, um, the uh, femoral head is displaced from the rest, of the rest of the femur. And so you can clearly see that. Also, great job, everyone, 96%, you know, well done. Uh, everyone's getting this right. Uh, so yeah, so we're gonna go over Skiffy for this question. Um, so this is a fracture of the growth plate of the proximal femur. Um, it's it's uh, resulting in the slipping of the epiphysis and the metaphysis. So that's where the Skiffy comes from. Uh, usually early adolescent, usually you'll see it in um, in an obese child. Uh, usually usually uh, usually it's, uh, unilateral, but it can be also bilateral, and sometimes you get it on the other side. Um, especially be, because, you know, you'll have instability generally on both sides of the hip. Um, sometimes it can be due to trauma. Like if the, uh, if your femoral head is already weak, then if you have some traumatic event, it can cause a slip of the femoral disc. And then also you have a chronic slip as well, which is slow progression of the, the, the displacement of the femoral head. Um, on presentation, uh, you'll have reduced range of motion. You'll have, you'll be holding the hip in external rotation. Um, and on a chronic slip, sometimes you won't, you won't uh, complain of hip pain. Sometimes it's, it's uh, you'll see knee pain, which is uh, referred pain in, into the knee. 
Um, and then on a clinical side, as you flex the hip, the hip will externally rotate because of the instability of the femoral head. Uh, so when you x you know, you also diagnose this with x-ray to kind of like leg calf perth. The thing you want to look for is a Klein sign. So this is the thing on the right side. So normally a normal Klein sign is, uh, the tops, um, you're going to make a line from the top of the femoral, uh, top of the femur, uh, through the femoral head. And the normal Klein sign should go through the femoral head as on the, as on the left in this patient. Well, on the abnormal Klein sign, if it's slipping, uh, the Klein sign is not going to go through the femoral head. So that's an abnormal Klein sign. And that's evidence of, of Skiffy. Um, you might see bloomer sign as, as well. That's subtle widening of the of the physis, um, and that could be a subtle finding um, in uh, in diagnosis of Skiffy. So that's why it's important to get uh, both knees, like get the contralateral lateral hip, uh, just because you might see these subtle signs in the widening of physis. You might, you know, it might not be like an obvious client sign uh, for a diagnosis of Skiffy. Um, adjunct uh, adjunct imaging includes like ultrasound, and CT, and MRI. But the first thing you're going to do, especially in the ED, is going to be an X-ray. All right. Um, so for treatment, uh, yeah, you're gonna do an ortho consultation, obviously, you're gonna do non-weight bearing. Uh, you don't want this to progress uh, on a, uh, very quickly. And then most people, uh, and then most of this, uh, the treatment is surgical, you know, you do fixation uh, in, uh, of the femoral head. Sometimes you can do an open reduction as well, but yeah, most of the time the, uh, the treatment is surgical. All right, and these are just the incorrect answers. All right, any questions about Skiffy or uh, like half or hip problems? Just a quick comment. I think just, I mean, in real life, it's more difficult to deviate. But I think on the board, you'll always see that like Cap Perth is like a younger child. Yeah. And Skippy is going to be that kind of key, key, key. So that can really key you in just in the set of the questions. What, what you're trying to do. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So for those that didn't hear, Dr. Willis did say that uh, uh, like Cap Perth is going to be a younger child on the boards, and then a Skippy is going to be like an obese early adolescent slash teenager. So the age can really clue you in. All right. Um, all right. Here's the next question. Question three. A two-year-old boy complains of leg pain after he fell down at home. He's small for his age, and these are his eyes as pictured. Um, X-rays review of fractures of the tibia and fibula as evidence of, and also uh, old healed flat fractures. Uh, what's most under, what's most likely underlying cause? Um, the answer is osteogenesis imperfecta. And once again, hundred percent. Great job, guys. Um, uh, and this, and we're just gonna go over what OI is and, and everything that's related to it. So osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, yeah, this is very common on the boards. Uh, it's also a dominant disorder of abnormal bone growth. It's a mutation of the genes for type one collagen. Um, that's what and it causes connective tissue disorder and also brittle, brittle bones and you know uh, frequent fractures. Um, here are some of the signs you might see. So yeah, so the blue eyes is characteristic for uh, one type of osteogenesis imperfecta. It's a very uh, easy clue. You'll see brittle teeth here as above. Um, you'll see uh, lots of long bone fractures in young kids and otherwise healthy kids who have like undergo minor trauma. Um, a lot of these children are wheelchair bound as you can see on the right. Um, and so this is just something you have to be aware of, uh, especially um, in, in sort of like non-accidental trauma workups. Um, you have to make sure they don't have OI or some other metabolic disorder that predisposes them to uh, you know long bone fractures. So uh, yeah, this is what it's talking about. So. Um, and so the, going over the wrong answer. So non accidental trauma is one of the, one of the questions and that's, it's not non accidental trauma because he has OI and he, he's, uh, he's predisposed to long bone fractures and very quick fractures. Um, so here are just some examples of, of, um, fractures that are suspicious for abuse. So here's the one here on the chest. You see multiple fractures in, in various stages of healing right here. Um, this is like in an infant where you have the parents uh, squeezing the torso and shaking them, and then you'll break rib, you'll break ribs that way. Um, this is the buckle handle fracture uh, of the of the tibia, and so here you can see like it's like a small bulge at the tip of the tibia. These are also characteristic of uh, fractures of abuse. Um, one uh, mnemonic we like to think about is called ten four. Um, so ten is torso, ear is a neck, and four, and so this is four years old. So any sort of bruising. And the torso, ears, and neck under four is pretty suspicious. And then any bruising at all for under four months is also suspicious. The idea is being that if you're four months old, you're not rolling around, you're not really crawling too much. So if you have bruising at all, uh, that's pretty suspicious for um, uh, like, you know, any sort of uh, non, non accidental trauma or child neglect. But that's, yeah, but 10 4, uh, we like to think uh, that's something that you can commit to memory uh, whenever you see a child like that with bruising. All right. So other um, incorrect. Fracture. So this is a, a other pathological fracture. So 
Um, sometimes you get a pathological fracture due to a disease. So sometimes if you have like underlying bony tumor or an osteosarcoma, um, you can get a pathological fracture that goes through the tumor line, which you see on the left. I think there's a question later that goes on, also goes along with it. Um, bent bone dysplasia, uh, pretty uncommon, uh, not too much to know about it, I think, but it can cause cranial uh, synostosis. So that's like premature fusing of, um, of your, uh, of your suture lines. Uh, you can have osteopenia, some facial features like low set ears, wide space eyes, like very syndromic looking, uh, physiology. Um, and then osteoporosis, generally you're not going to see this in children. So that's, uh, probably an unlikely answer if you see a kid with, uh, multiple fractures. All right. And so yeah, these are, yeah, so these are all on EM, uh, on M coach. So if you want to review the answers yeah, they're also online, you can uh, easily uh, look at those as well. All right. Next question. Uh, you're assessing a five-year-old male, which of the, these disorders affecting bones would be a relative contraindication to IO placement. Uh, so it's a vancomianemia, JRA, like half perth, osteogenesis imperfecta or vectoral. Um, and answer is OI, you know, brittle bones. You don't want to induce more trauma to the bones. Um, and also very good guys, uh, 86%. Of you guys are killing it today. Um, so just, just go over IO placement in general, uh, just uh, as a quick review for everyone. Um, there are a lot of places you can put the IO. Generally in children, we're going to put it in the leg. Uh, your first site that you're going to think about is going to be the proximal tibia, so the anterior medial surface. Um, you know, two, about two centimeters below the tibial tuberosity. You want to aim uh, perpendicularly, 90 degrees onto the skin, uh, but pointing caudally to avoid the growth plate. Uh, you can also do the distal tibia as a second line, so around the ankle, or you can do the femoral. I think the femoral, typically for like a young child, or like an infant, that might be the best second place to go, just because it's the um, you have uh, it's like the thickest bone in the area, so. Generally, if you're putting an IO into a young child, you're going through the bone. That's why it's not successful. So you want to go through a thicker bone. And so the- I love the distal femur with the IO, especially when you're talking about muscles. They're just like, it's a great place to go. Um, you're going through a but that could be the most of your knee is kind of long. Um, and then the tibia is going to be something that you can do Yeah, so Dr. Howe uh, is a big proponent of distal oh, I <laughs> IOs and uh, distal femur IOs, yes. especially a young child. Yeah, because if you have a lot of subcutaneous fat, if you're a chunky baby, um, the needle might pop out uh, and it might not be long enough. And so that's why distal femur using a long needle uh, would be a good idea. Uh, so this is how you put in an IO. You want to grab an IO dressing, which is separate from the kid. You want to go perpendicular to the bone. And, you know, uh, you, most of the time we don't, we have, uh, you know, we have the easy IO drill. And once you press the uh, once you press the trigger, it spins it really fast. You don't actually have to put any pressure. You should let the needle drive itself and then stop once um, once it's in the in the bone. You don't have to actually press down um, and introduce more pressure uh, into the drill. Um, you should draw back once you're in. You might not always get blood, and the blood you do get is marrow, so it's going to be thicker than normal. Um, you can put any medicine. You can use it as a central line, so you can put anything you would otherwise put as a central line through the IO. Um, most labs will be fine, except the CBC, you'll, because you're testing bone marrow, um, the CBC is going to be a little weird. So uh, those tests will be inaccurate. Um, and then the idea is that with the IO, especially in the resuscitation, you want to give two sticks for a peripheral IV, then go for an IO. That's, uh, that's going to be the more question uh, for like a, a crashing child or any, any sort of uh, resusc acute resuscitation. Um, yeah, there's a relative contraindication if there's like a fracture there or if there's any infection or burn at the site. So uh, if the bone's broken or the skin's broken, try to go, uh, try to go for an alternate area if you can. Um, that's pretty much it. And then, yeah, just go over the wrong answer. So Fanconi anemia is a condition that you might get tested on. It's something you should be aware of. Uh, there's, and also you should be aware that there's Fanconi anemia and also Fanconi syndrome, which is different. Um, I think it's the same Fanconi, but... Uh, you know, double check that. Anyway, Fanconi anemia is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. It's like a syndromic thing. Um, what you really see is these kids will have short stature, really brittle bones. Sometimes they're missing uh, a, like a radius. Um, they'll oftentimes they'll have anemia or thrombocytopenia. Um, if you work in a children's hospital or something adjacent to a children's hospital, a lot of times they'll be following um, like our, our hemon group. Sometimes they have central lines for frequent transfusions. Uh, sorry, not central, like a port for frequent transfusions. Um, 
And they also have apathic anemia too, which is the cause of their anemia and thrombocytopenia. And so uh, they have like a very characteristic facies here, like on the right. Um, so just be aware that Fanconi is anemia is something that you'll see sometimes. Yes, Dr. Howe. Yeah, Fanconi syndrome is associated with electrolyte abnormalities, uh, type 1 RTA. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we don't have epidemics anymore. Um, so GR, so these are the other answers. So GRA, uh, it's usually like rheumatoid arthritis before age 16, like half birth we went over already. Um, and also Skiffy as well. So these are other, other things uh, that were wrong answers. And then Bacterol, just be aware that this is a thing. So Bacterol isn't like a specific disease. It's just a constellation of syndromes that are often seen together in newborns. Uh, so these are all usually good general uh, anomalies. And so you'll see like a vertebral defect, anal atresia, some cardiac syndrome, T fistula, renal disease, uh, absent thumbs, and hematologic disorders. There's no like one name for any of these things, but like a lot, oftentimes you'll see a lot of these defects uh, all in the same child. And so if you see a couple of these, and it's called Bacterol uh, Syndrome, um, and just be aware that it exists, but it's not a contraindication for putting an IO in one of these people. All right, questions about that? All right, cool, next question. Um, this is question five, 15 year old male presents with several weeks of non-traumatic right knee pain. This is his x-ray. You strongly suspect a bone malignancy. What's the most likely diagnosis? So this question is asking what's the most like, what's the most common bone cancer in a teenager? Um, and the answer is osteosarcoma, you know? Um, so most, yeah, about you half of you got this right. So we'll go over why this is the answer, not the other ones. So. Uh, yeah, so this is, the, so osteosarcoma is the most common, uh, bone malignancy in pediatrics. Uh, usually you see it in areas of high bone growth, so around the growth plate. That's why in this patient it's around, it's in the knee, uh, because that's where, that's around the growth plate and that's where the most, um, leg length, uh, develops in, in a, in a, in a child. Um, there's a bimodal distribution usually occurs in the teenage years. And then again, uh, when you're, when you're a senior citizen, um, these are the other kinds of neoplasm that we'll go over. So osteosarcoma. Uh, Ewing sarcoma, uh, osteoid osteoma, which is benign, and we'll go over that. And then these, then other cartilaginous uh, um, bone growths, bone tumors, so osteochondroma and uh, endochondroma, endochondroma. So uh, osteosarcoma, yeah, we sort of went over that. Typically, you'll have progressively worsening pain, some morning bone pain, um, usually found in long bones. So uh, you know, femur, tibia, the humerus, and you'll see this classic sunburst pattern. So uh, if you go back. Uh, you can kind of see it's uh, kind of just going out everywhere, looking like a sun. Um, and then uh, you're going to have chemotherapy and surgery for it. So yeah, here's the periosteal reaction sunburst pattern. You can kind of see it better here. Um, very characteristic of uh, osteosarcoma. So you can see this, uh, that's going to be the answer. Ewing sarcoma. So it's, uh, it's um, also uh, not the most, not as common as osteosarcoma, but also something you should be aware of in teenagers is another cause of bone cancer in a child. Um, a lot of times you have systemic symptoms like weight loss, like B symptoms, so like weight loss, um, fevers, um, night sweats, you can have systemic symptoms. And the typical uh, x-ray is onion skinny or moth-eaten um, appearance. And so these are images of Ewing sarcoma um, right here. I guess if you squint hard enough, it looks like an onion skin. Um, the other thing is, um, I mean, this is like a step one question, like a step one, uh, translocation. So it's like it's translocation of, of uh, chromosomes 11 and 22. Um, and then what you remember is 11 and 22 equals 33, which is Patrick Ewing's jersey number. So that's Ewing sarcoma. All right. Uh, osteoid osteoma, this is a benign lesion. You'll see this. Usually these are found incidentally or sometimes if they grow big enough, you'll, uh, they'll come in with bone pain and do an x-ray and find it. Um, usually in the lower extremities. Um, this is uh, usually pain that's worse at night or leave with NSAIDs. And you'll see a radiolucent center surrounded by a thick sclerotic bone, which is uh, right here, radiolucent center, thick sclerotic bone. This is an osteoid osteoma. These are benign lesions. Sometimes you can remove them if they cause a lot of pain, but usually these are, aren't, aren't uh, too serious. Same thing with osteocardroma. These are also benign. And these are kind of like, uh, these are like bone spurs. These are like uh, 
outgrowths of bones. And sometimes you'll, you know, see a kid with a nodule or something like that, and you'll find this on x-ray and it's a very characteristic image. And this is an osteochondroma. These are also um, benign, uh, but they can also be removed if they're causing a lot of pain. And it kind of looks like a cauliflower, which is what you see here. Um, but also another thing you might get tested on. All right, and that's it. Uh, question six. So here's another one. 15 year old male appear, uh, presents with acute right onset arm pain. He was pitching and, had, and uh, he was pitching at the time when the pain developed. He's otherwise healthy. Um, he has swelling and pain tenderness of his other upper arm. Uh, as as x-ray is below, which is right here, it's a, it's a fracture. Uh, what's the most likely etiology of his injury? And some malignant bone lesion. Yeah, so this is a pathological fracture. Um, we'll see you got this right as well, great job. Um, and just a little bit of pathophys. Um, so the reason you have pathological fractures is because the bone in that area is weakened. Uh, so you got osteolytic lesions of the bone um, are activated osteoclasts. So, so you have increased bone breakdown and more brittle bones in that area. And that's why you get the pathological fracture due to, and you get, you'll, you'll have some minor trauma and then you'll get, you'll get the fracture. Um, you'll see a fracture line through the heterogeneous uh, genius area of the bone. And so you can see how here the bone is in uh, the cortex is a little bit disrupted and, you know, due to minor trauma, you'll have a fracture through that line. Um, yeah, very common causes of pathological fracture. So bone tumors, you know, benign versus, uh, malignant, uh, Severe rickets of vitamin D deficiency can cause it. OI can cause any any sort of brittle bones. Uh, hyperparathyroidism or juvenile osteoporosis or chronic osteo. So any sort of chronic disease can cause a pathological fracture. Um, here's a little bit thing on rickets. Uh, yeah, uh, deficient mineralization due to vitamin D deficiency. Um, you'll see uh, some characteristic findings are widening of the PCO. Uh, a physio plate, so you maybe see some frontal bossing over here. Uh, you'll see some, uh, you know, bending of the knee like this due to chronic deficiency. Uh, you'll see long bone fractures due to secondary to osteopenia. Um, so you, yeah, so this is another like thing you should rule out before. Uh, if you see like a suspicious fracture, uh, you know, you want, you want to rule out OI. You also want to rule out rickets as part of your workup. And so you'll send like a vitamin D and a calcium level and everything like that. Um, Oh, I, uh, yeah, we all sort of, this is, yeah, we all sort of went through this before. So, you know, blue eyes, uh, brittle teeth, long bone fractures, um, you know, short stature, hearing loss. Uh, yeah, just be, yeah, OI is something that is asked about a lot. And then high specificity fractures. So, um, yeah, just to go over sort of this again. So buckle handle fractures here on the right, uh, long bone fractures that are very suspicious. Um, multiple rib fractures or fractures in various stages of healing, all very suspicious for child abuse. And uh, yep. so next question, questions about those two. Cool. So uh, question seven, uh, five-year-old presents after high-speed MVC. He's complaining about left hip pain. Picture is taken here. He's neurovascularly intact. What's the most common complication of his diagnosis? Um, you can see, obviously, you can see his left hip is... Uh, displaced obviously so that's that's the that's his diagnosis then the most common um complications is that a vascular necrosis of the hip most of you got that right which is great um and then not too much to go through over that except um so uh about a quarter of you picked femoral nerve pal palsy and the reason for a posterior hip location you're more likely to get a sciatical nerve palsy as opposed to a femoral because it's a posterior hip location uh hemodynamic instability and limb, limb ischemia is a rare complication, but not as common as avascular necrosis, just because you're disrupting the femoral head from the acetabulum. And so um, any, anytime you do that, you're gonna decrease the blood flow to the femoral head and increase your chance for avascular necrosis. All right. uh, question A, 21 year old student has two weeks of progressive swelling and pain in the elbow, uh, spending a lot of time on his computer for studying. He has no fevers and his vital signs are normal. This is his elbow here. You can see swelling of his right elbow. Um, there's some boggy swelling and tenderness in the area, but good range of motion. Uh, white white can inflammatory markers are normal. What's the most appropriate management? And the answer is NSAIDs, rest, and compression. So this question is more of like, um, it's not so much like the right clinical answer, but like how to answer this question. And most of you got this right, which is great. Uh, but this patient has bursitis. Um, you know, it's an inflammation of the bursa usually caused by direct injury, some trauma, maybe an infection or inflammation. Um, so in this case, the kid was, uh, the idea is that he's, he's putting his elbows a lot on his computer when he's studying. And so that's 
So the, uh, the chronic trauma is causing this bursitis there. Um, you're gonna have uh, pain and compression in the bursa and then flexion of the elbow and knee. So the idea is that if you have bursitis, um, if you, uh, when you don't, when you, um, when you extend the surrounding muscles, when you extend, fully extend his arm, the pain should get better, but then it should get worse when you flex it because you're flexing the surrounding muscles. And the idea is you want to roll on infection, which is also true here. But the reason A isn't the answer is because you don't want to give antibiotics isn't the answer. Aspiration may be an answer, but antibiotics is not an answer. And so that's why C is a better choice compared to one. You know, you might aspirate it as part of your workup, but you're not going to automatically put them on antibiotics um, because his lab tests are normal. So that's like sort of the, where they're trying to uh, point you in that direction. <laughs> yeah, he's young and healthy too. They don't give you like the sinovial fluid analysis. And so I think that, that's, that's why they're going towards more bursitis as opposed to a septic joint. All right, so question nine, uh, two month old brought to the ER because the older uh, brother has a cough and the parents just want a medical exam. She's healthy, well appearing without signs of bruising. Um, but you notice that the folds of their skin and their thigh and buttocks are noted to be asymmetrical. And then the abduction of the left hip causes a clunk. Uh, what imaging studies most likely confirm the diagnosis? Uh, and so this diagnosis is one is developmental dysplasia of the hip and the answer is ultrasound. Once well, you got that right, which is great. And so we're gonna go over this for a second as well. So developmental, so uh, yeah. So DDH is something that every uh, general pediatrician uh, gets drilled into the head during residency. It's part of the newborn exam. You're doing it every time you examine an infant. Uh, you're gonna arrange the acetabulum in the hip and you're gonna feel for a click. Um, in cause, I, you can, you know, it's it's kind of like an umbrella term for a range of hip and um, uh, hip and uh, acetabular uh, diseases. So there's acetabular dysplasia, there's hip location. There's no real cause, um, but it, it is seen, it has been found to be run in the family. And then, so it's part of your newborn physical exam. Um, one way, the way it's diagnosed is using ultrasound. And so this is, we're just gonna go over how you can do it quickly. So here uh, it's diagnosed with ultrasound. The way you do it is you have the, you have the patient lie on their stomach and then you're kind of look, using linear probe to look at it from the lateral side of the hip. And when you're looking at, this is the view you want here. And then these are uh, overlay of the structures that you're looking for. So this, so, you want this picture when you're looking at the ultrasound. Uh, the iliac bone is over here. You want it the, over on top is the uh, gluteal medius, and then you want to get the femoral head, the iliac bone in the center, and then also the, the labrum over here. And then this is the view you want because you, you got to measure some angles um, in order to diagnose DDH. This is on your boards. So it's just kind of like FYI if you want to be interested in it. Um, you're going to draw a line through the iliac. Uh, the iliac bone, and then you can draw another line through the tip of the iliac bone through uh, the, the, the biggest angle, um, the bony rim of the acetabulum right here. And then you're gonna, and then the angle you measure is this, the alpha angle. Um, in general, uh, a normal hip is gonna have an alpha angle more than 60, uh, but there's a lot of different kinds of DDH with different alpha angles and beta angles, but that's the one, that's the main angle you wanna look for is the alpha angle of 60 when you're looking at this ultrasound. Um, the treatment of it, if you do have DVH, is a pavic harness, which kind of looks like this. It just kind of keeps the hip in place and prevents like chronic dislocations. Uh, they have to wear this for, you know, usually months, maybe years. Uh, but these are followed by orthopedics and generally kids do very well uh, if they're treated appropriately. The way you do it, the way you assess for hip flicking is the Barlow and Oral, oral Alani maneuvers. Can I? Yeah, can we, can, I, can we play this video? Okay. You do it. Oops. Can we? Yeah. So play that video. Yeah, it's like three, it's like it's ten seconds. Uh, it's that. So that's that wing. Oh, that. Yeah, I just wanted to. Yeah, I just wanted to play that wing. Yeah, you can put, yeah, it starts in the middle. Yeah, you can floor plane it there. It's a congenital deformation or misalignment of the hip joint. It is more common. It's a great video. Family history of dysplasia or female, or who had a breach presentation in utero. Assess the hips one at a time using two maneuvers. 
In the Barlow maneuver, first adduct the hip by bringing the thigh toward the midline. Then apply a gentle posterior pressure to the knee. In the Ortolani maneuver, flex the infant's knees to a 90 degree position. Then abduct the legs by folding the thigh outwards. Oh, yeah. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. So like, you're gonna do both. Uh, as part of the newborn exam, you actually do both. Um, you do both maneuvers. The Barlow, you're actually dislocating the hip and that's why you feel the click and the order line, you're putting the hip back into place and that's why you feel the click there. Um, and so when you do both, if there is DDH, you're gonna feel a click usually in both maneuvers. Let me just make sure, I think your mouse went for me. Oh, can I just pre can I press present? Okay. Yeah. Dr. Shore. Uh, so the one thing about the borrow or the line, it should be painless. The baby should not notice that you're doing it. But even if you get the clump, the baby's happy and playful during the whole procedure. Uh, if you find pain on your borrow or the line, you should be concerned with something else. I had a case getting a fellowship that ended up being a femur fracture and a two-week-old uh, that had a positive borrow or the line. Uh, and it ends up being a femur fracture that that's what you're feeling with the fracture, not the oral line the displacement. So if there's pain, you have to be concerned with the fracture. Yeah, what Dr. Shore was saying, um, the, those two maneuvers are painless. So if you do feel the patient's wincing or is in pain, you should be concerned about something else, like like a fracture in the air or something like that. Uh, there's a discussion on the chat. Ah. So there was a question, how emergently does this need to be diagnosed? Like if they're in the community, how it takes? Yeah, outpatient management. Yeah, these are typically outpatient management. Like, yeah, if it's if it's found in like a pediatrician's office during a well child visit, they're not going to like send them to the ED for this. It'll send them for an ultrasound, and if it's abnormal, they'll refer them to orthopedics. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, so question 10. Uh, <laughs> Eight-year-old girl, history of Vancouver anemia presents to the ED after uh, MVA. What abnormality do you find, do you expect to find that's related to her chronic disease? Um, so yeah, this is just knowing, this is this question is asking you to know about Vancouver's anemia and the answer is aplasia of the radius. Um, that's the one thing that's associated with Vancouver's anemia and most of you got that right, which is great. Um, everything else is actually associated with osteogenesis imperfecta. B, C, and D are also are all OI. And then tall stature is associated with neither of those because in both Fanconi's anemia and OI, you're, you're, uh, you have short stature. All right, so Fanconi's anemia, uh, it's autosomal recessive. You get aplastic anemia and pancytopenia. You have short stature, hypogonadism. You have some extremity malformations. And then you oftentimes will be missing a radius, kind of like this. And again, it's different from Fanconi syndrome um, that's associated with RTAs and electrolyte disturbances. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Question 11. Um, this is a five-year-old boy presenting one to two days of limp. He's complaining of pain in his left groin. There's no history of trauma. Um, his parents have noticed mild fevers at home. He has a TMAX of 100.7. His leg is held in flexion. He has minimal pain with active range of motion. He has decreased range of motion with internal rotation and abduction. His x-rays are normal. Which of the following most supports his, which of the following supports the most likely diagnosis? Um, so the diagnosis is tenosynovitis, which we'll go over in a second, but the answer is white blood cells of 11,000. 11, and actually a minority of patients got, of residents got this correct. And I think it's because the answer is kind of confusing. It, you, you have to think about it backwards and which I hope will be clear after we go over the answers. So the answer is transient synovitis, and usually it happens at, at around ages three through nine. It's post-viral. Uh, the child's limping. He's well-appearing, but may have a low-grade fever. Um, but the idea is you need to rule out septic arthritis, right? And so the criteria you should be aware of is the COCA criteria, and basically it's four things. So one is non-weight bearing. This is COCA criteria is developed to rule out septic arthritis in the hip. Um, so you have to be non-weight bearing, Tmax over 101.5, ESR over 40, and white blood cells over 12,000. And so if you go back to the question, you think this kid has a uh, transient tenosynovitis. And so you wanna pick the, the lab result that, uh, that supports that. So 
in order, so core criteria cutoff is 12,000. So that's why 11,000 is the answer. Um, but that's why you want something that's lower. But the ESR here in this answer is 50, but core criteria is 40. So if you had, so because this is higher than 40, that's not gonna be the answer. And then with CRP, CRP of three is actually, is pretty small, but you, you have to be careful because the units are gonna be different based on the hospital and based on the test that you're gonna be working on. So for example, at county, the, the units for CRP are milligrams per liter and not milligrams per deciliter. So if you convert this to milligrams per liter, it's actually 30 and then that's pretty high. Um, and so that's why that's not the answer either. But so just be aware of the units that they might be different than what you're used to seeing clinically. Um, but be aware that they do exist. And so that being said, uh, there's studies that show that weight-bearing children with hip effusions and a CRP less than 20 milligrams per liter uh, have a less than 1% chance risk of septic carcinitis. So anything more than 20 or 20 milligrams per liter or two milligrams per deciliter, um, that should raise your, raise your suspicion for septic arthritis in, in this kind of patient. So just that, that you should be careful about. Um, and then, uh, yeah, here, final question. So 21-year-old year male with no past medical history presents the ED after development of left knee pain and swelling. He's gradually worsened after playing basketball three days ago. It's worse with ambulation. Bowel signs are stable. Uh, the knee is tender, edematous, and warm to the touch. His knee radiograph shows small effusion, but no acute fracture. What's the most appropriate next step in management? Um, yes, yeah, so you have a knee effusion that uh, is warm to touch and edematous, so you want to rule out a fracture. And so... You want to rely on infection, and that's why arthrocentesis is the answer. Um, some people picked uh, pilocene immobilizer, and some said get labs, but um, you know, the most definitive treatment is going to be arthrocentesis. You know, it's because he has a monoticular arthritis. He has signs, he has some evidence that it might be infectious, you know, because on exam it's tender, edematous, and warm to touch. So you worry about cellulitis or a septic hip, even though he has no fever. And so, you know, a CBC and a CRP aren't going to reassure you given your physical exam. And that's why arthrocentesis is going to be the answer um, to rule out a septic, uh, septic arthritis. All right. And then um, for in terms of the synovial fluid analysis, you're going to look for, for septic arthritis, you need 50,000 WBCs um, and more than 70% polys for septic arthritis. Anything less than that is going to be either inflammatory or, or normal. Um, so that's what you're looking for on the uh, on the knee aspiration, uh, which is very similar to the uh, adult adult criteria. All right, um, and that's the end of our board review. Uh, any final questions? All right, great. Thanks so much, guys.